This is September 4th, 2001. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. And we're privileged to have with us today Ralph Bolton. Ralph, welcome. We're very glad to have you with us. May I ask you when you were born? I was born September, September 12, 1920. And where were you born? Well, Waltham, Massachusetts. And your current address? Natick. Okay, and your marital status? I married and have had four children. I'm married 47 years. I have one daughter and three sons. How about grandchildren? Five grandchildren. Holy mackerel, that's very good, sir. My grandchildren, uh, let me see, one is in New Hampshire. One of my twin boys, she is eight and three, a boy eight, the daughter three, and my other son has, Ray has, uh, I think now, six and three, I have like six and three, and my oldest boy, Eddie, he has a daughter, oh, she graduated from Natick High School last year. Where were, you, where were you raised, Ralph? Where did you grow up as a kid? I grew up as a kid in, in, in Waltham and Weston, town of Weston. And uh, what occasion did you move to Natick? Did you come to Natick after the war or when? I came to Natick after the war. <clears throat> we uh, looked around trying to find a place to live and uh, and we moved to Natick. First of all, I moved, I moved to California from from Weston and back to, back to Natick again. And I've been in Natick now for 31 years. Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> so you're a, a, an old time townie here. Yes, that's, I am. that's good. Tell us a little bit about your father, your mother. What did your dad do for a living? Well, my father, my father was, uh, well, my father. He was, he was in the church organ business. He was a reed voicer. And the church organ was the Aeolian, Aeolian Skinner Organ Company oh, in sure. Dorchester. Yeah. And he was a reed voicer. And he worked at that, at that trade for probably you know, 35 years. And uh, he, he was considered an organ builder. <coughs> and uh, my mother, she uh, lived in Waltham a good part of her life, and she, she was a on the payroll at the, at the Waltham Watch Company, the old Waltham Watch Company in Waltham. Very famous, very famous yes, building. Yeah. It's still there. Largest in the world, yeah. largest in the world. What, what, did you go to school in Waltham? That is uh, grammar school, grade school, yes, high I school? Did. Yes, I um, did. Tell us about the times uh, as, say, in the dates of 1940, something like that. Were you in school then? I graduated from Weston High School in 1940. In my class, there were 42 in my class. 42, that's, 42. A, that's a kind of small school, isn't Very it? Very small. In 1940, did you guys look at the fact that Europe is at war and think that, did you ever conceive that you might be uh, in a war yourself within a year or so? I sure did. What, what did you talk about? What, what signs did you see? Well, my father and I used to talk, we used to watch the campaigns in Europe, the war that we had, prior to the invasion. And, and uh, we used to watch the armies, armies move in Europe, different sectors, and, as, and uh, try to uh, figure out who was going to do what at the time. Once the German army and the, and the Russian army, and, uh, we discussed the maps in detail. Did you literally uh, sit over maps yes, and look at the situation right. in Europe? Did, yeah. And did your dad and you discuss the fact that you were, uh, in 1940, you were 20 years old? Right. Um, were you thinking, I'm going to be part of this? In the back of my mind, yes, I did. I, I thought someday I'd be, I'd be okay. I'd be and then along came Pearl Harbor uh, in 1941. That's right. Uh, 
What was your draft status at that time? Were you subject to going to the uh, services or what? Well, at that time, I, uh, I had registered for the draft. And, and in fact, at that time, my draft board was here in Natick. I registered over here in Natick. And what happened, I uh, was classified as uh, top, uh, I'm trying to think now. What, was it, were you 1A? 1A, yes. So 1A was subject to a call as soon as your number came up, literally. I had no problem at all. The physical was no problem at all. Okay, now Pearl Harbor comes. Um, how, when did you enter the military service? I entered the military service on February 23rd, 1942. Within two months of Pearl Harbor then, or three months? After, yeah. February of 42? Tell me about where you went. Did you go to a recruiting office somewhere? Well, yes, I, uh, I didn't, uh, I, I was not drafted. I, I, I changed, I, I, at the time I would probably enlist because I, I just about ready to be drafted, so I, I enlisted in 19, February 23rd. Where, where did you go? I went to, uh, I went to, uh, uh, Went to, went to Boston. I listed in Boston, and, uh, and from Boston I was sent to Fort Devens. Okay, hold up. You had a choice now: Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, um, Air Force. Right. What did you choose, and why? I chose the Army at the time because at, at the time, at that time, the German U-boat activity was quite prevalent in the North Atlantic. They were sinking a lot of the ships. I said, I want to, I want to stay away from the Navy. <laughs> my father was in the Navy in the first, although he was in the Navy in the first World War, my father. So I said, I, th I think we'll take a chance in <laughs> the Army, so I, I enlisted in the Army. In Boston, Massachusetts, yes. uh, February of 1942. Right. You came home and said to your folks, I'm in the Army now. That, that, that same day I enlisted, I didn't have a chance to go home. I had to call. Somewhere, I believe. And he sent me to Fort Devens after I called. E exactly that day? Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of quick, isn't yeah. it? It was quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, Did you call up your family over the telephone think, and say, guess I what? Them. Yes, I think I called the North Station. He left in the train, troop train, the North Station to Fort Devens. And uh, I believe I called them and paid for them. Were, were any friends or high school buddies or anybody you knew with you, did they go down and join at the same time? I'm not sure. They weren't with me at the time. But some, of the, some of the men from town, young folk of my age, probably did, but I don't know who they were. But uh, I uh, said, I, I, it's time for me to go, so I'm going to have to go before I'm drafted. So they put you on a train, sent you out to the middle of the state here in Fort Devens, and tell us about going there. Where, where you had you been away from home before that? Uh, not really, not, not, not any length of time, no, just some vacation trips and whatnot. So you're just 20, 21 years old, and you're in the Army, right. and you're in Fort Devens. Tell us about Fort Devens, would you? Well, up at Fort Devens, it was just an induction center anyway. And they, they, they had to process you up there. You, uh, I was there, I think, um, three, three, three or four days, and uh, we got the uh, outfit, I uh, draw, uh, draw a uniform, and a few th other things we had to have at the time. He gave us a barracks bag, I believe. And, uh, it was very cold. Oh, was it cold up there? It was very cold, freezing cold. And the bar even the barracks were cold. Of course, in February that time of year, it would be cool anyway. And it's, it's, uh, I understood it all right. It didn't bother me at all. That's about all there was to it, really. Other people who have gone through your experience and talked to us about it, 
about going to Devon's, were there as you were three or four days, and they took a battery of tests to determine what the Army was going to do with you. Do you remember doing that? I believe I have a faint recollection of that. But I'm not sure the, the extent of it. You know. When when uh, when you left Devon's, uh, where did you go? We, uh, Fort De we left Fort Devon's. We went to Camp Cross, South Carolina. Thirteen weeks basic training. Uh, training in what now? Training. Infantry. Infantry, tra infantry training. So at Devon's, they had decided you were going into the infantry. Yes. Okay. And when you went down to South Carolina, uh, how large a group? Did you know guys in the group, or were you, again, traveling by yourself? There were certain, certain fellows around Boston I, I became acquainted with, uh, all, all Austin, Brighton, and uh, nobody from around this area here. And uh, went down there, and uh, we got acquainted with them. Uh, we have, and then uh, there weren't too many though. Some some were from the western part of the state. Some were from from probably down this area around here. Okay, and you're into infantry training uh, for 13 weeks down there. Would would you rather have done something else in the Army, or would, did they say, this is what you're going to do? I would rather have, I put in, actually, I put in for the medical corps. I, try, I tried to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I tried to uh, get in the medics, but they sent me, at that time, they needed men, they needed the infantry. Yeah. They needed men, so, so they sent me on the side. Infantry on the side. Okay, I, I'm not familiar with uh, Camp Crofts. How did this differ from Fort Jackson? Were you around the Columbia area? Uh, Where were you in South Carolina? I was so not too far from Columbia. Okay. Did the anything in your background or the Army prepare you now for you're, you're exposed to the, the South? the Southern culture. Uh, did this come as a uh, surprise to you, a shock to you? Um, did you know about the South? Well, yes, I, I knew uh, oh, not too much about it at the time, but I had an idea it might be a little different than uh, up, up in the out north here. But the, uh, down there they were very antagonistic toward the North, toward the Yankees. And I just made the, I made the most of it. I made friends, you know, southern friends down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just so happened that we got along pretty well down there. The camp Croft. And, uh, in 13 weeks, can you tell us some of the things you did and you learned as, as part of your first assignment in the Army? Yes. the. Uh, uh, when we I arrived down there, they put us in, 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 a, in a rank, single rank, and they they said the old buck size and come out. He said, "I want to fill uh, our recruits here. I want you. I want you to uh, watch me carefully on, on the facing, the right face, left hand, his left right face and left face." And when I turn right, I want you to turn right. So he would say left face, left face, and turn left, which we did. And uh, of course, it was different. Some would go one way, <laughs> but then uh, we had did have some close order drill, which that was part of it. Our facings and the about face, and the right flank, left flank. Of course, the, the most of the guys probably them were getting mixed up on the. And then they go different ways. But uh, all in all, it wasn't, wasn't too bad. We had, we had of course, rifle, rifle, uh, 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 rifle uh, inspection, and also we had. Uh, what, ki what kind of uh, weapon were you issued? Did, did you have Garands at that time? No, the M1? The Springfield O3. You had the O3s? Yeah, the O3, yeah. Springfield O3, that was quite a rifle. <laughs> Did you have 
enough equipment. You weren't training with broomsticks and trucks that were had the word tank painted on the side of it. Or did you feel the Army uh, had all the equipment you needed to learn your basic skills? Yes. We, we, were, we, were, we were issued the old freeze right away, almost right away. And the sergeant would give us a nomenclature to show us how to load, lock and load and, and use the use the rifle. Give it, try and teach us the uh, nomenclature of the, of the weapon itself, which was quite a weapon. This, uh, did you uh, work with any other kind of weapons, uh, machine guns, bazookas, or whatever? Yes, we. Uh, uh, trying to think now. We have the. Uh, a lot, 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 of, lot in those days it was simulated. It wasn't the real thing, you know. But well, the rifle was, what we had, had rifle practice on the range. We had, we had some mortars there, 60 millimeter mortars. But uh, just just a dry run, so to speak, on those. They call it dry runs. And then we had the hand grenade throwing to one, which was just a simulated, wasn't it? But the basic things of the infantry, we, we had uh, they tried to teach us down there. At the end of the 13 weeks down there, we had, they gave us a certificate of, 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 of uh, qualification for, for, for 13 weeks. Did all of you come out of this place with the same certification? You were all riflemen. You didn't begin to specialize into Mortars no. or something. No, we were all, all away from coming out. <coughs> Excuse me. And because uh, that was the basic training of the infantry, and uh, it was all all away from. Them. And um, after the, your thirteen weeks, you were certified. And yes. Where did you go from there? From, from Camp Croft, South Carolina, we went to uh, sent down to. Camp Gordon, Georgia, which was near Augusta. And uh, that, that's why the sign of the regular outfit, which was the 4th Motorized Division. And uh, I was assigned to the infantry company down there, the 4th Motorized Division. They had half tracks, well, half tracks. We rode half tracks around the, the, the drill area on the center of the post. That was down there for see, four, 14 months, I was down there. For how long? 14 months. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why were you there 14 months? So uh, what? Well, they weren't. They weren't. They wanted to train us uh, in the best training possible. I don't know what the. Uh, I think it was 14 months, yes. He rode in half tracks. We well, that, that would take you up to about June of 43. Is that correct? Let me see now. Must, must, must have been. We went, went north from there to Fort Dixon, Jersey, I believe. Yeah. But if you were there, uh, say, a year, uh, 14 months. Tell us more about your training. In, in a motorized division, um, what specifically were you doing then as an infantryman? Well, at that time I was uh, assigned to a, uh, a part of a weapons platoon. There were two mortar squads, two machine gun squads in this platoon, weapons platoon. And I, I was initially trained for a, a, a 30 caliber light machine gun, an ammunition carrier, which I was both, actually. And uh, that was what I was trained for down there. In a way, for the re rest of the war, I don't, I don't mean to skip ahead, but is this the job you had for the rest of the war with a 30 caliber machine gun? And, and ammunition carrier, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so they were prepping you for the job you were going to carry That's through right. the war. 
I've got you in uh, Camp Gordon in Georgia for this. Uh, did you go to a Gordon Johnson in Florida? Yes, we did. And when was that? That was, uh, let me see, when? I thought we went to Fort Dix before, after, after Camp Gordon. I thought we did. I, I have that in your record, yes. Yeah. And then we went down to Camp Gordon Johnson, Florida, troop train down there. That was the Gulf of, that was the panhandle of Florida, right near in the town of Carabell, I believe, and uh, not too far from Pensacola, Apalachicola, as I remember it now. <coughs> and that was uh, well, it was swampy down there. You were really in Dixie. You're getting yeah. over toward Alabama, right. Mississippi, yeah. First time I've ever seen it. I've ever been down south. First time I've been down south. I mean, in Florida, I mean. And this is, you, I, I think, if I'm following you correctly, you're into the summer now. Uh, yes. I was Must honest. have been very warm down there. It was quite warm. Yeah. In Florida, um, tell me approximately the date, dates you were in Florida so I can equate what, what was happening in Europe at the same time. I remember. I can't remember the exact dates that we were, we were down there, but uh, I can't remember the dates we were down there offhand. But I do know that. <coughs> excuse me. It was uh, quite warm, and uh, we did have an amphibious train down there. Out, out in the, out in the Gulf. Right in the Gulf, yes. Uh, for you must have felt they were prepping you for some kind of an invasion. I sure did. I think we're, so we were down, uh, we had uh, an amphibious train down there, landing craft on the beach, a ramp would come down the beach, and I had to hit the beach. We knew then that we were going to, we were going to go somewhere, invasion somewhere. And uh, we, in fact, some some of the men couldn't swim, so they, they had to uh, they had to uh, take swimming lessons by the numbers right on, on, the, on the beach. I fortunately I could swim. I know how to swim. But they went down on the summer paddling, kicking their feet and moving their arms and hands. And uh, they, when they left there, they didn't know how to swim. When they left there. <laughs> For some of these men. Uh, was it the first time they'd seen an ocean, even though it was the Gulf of Mexico? Yes, I would say. And well. they're, they're being asked to go out in little boats, and uh, I imagine their reaction was uh, being somewhat dubious about this. Right, it was. I'm, I'm sure some of the men from Tennessee and Alabama, some of the United States, they'd never seen the ocean before. Of course, a lot of men from up here had. I'd been near salt water quite a bit, and fresh water too. But all in all, it was the, the worst part of it down there was the, the those red bugs with chickens, they call them. Your boys were peppered with those. Lots of bites. Yeah, yeah. From the bites from the, from the, from did the swamps. You get, did you get home at all, Ralph? Uh, you, you, uh, last you, time you Heard from your parents, you, you called them up from North Station and got on a train and took off. Did, did you get home at all? I did have a furlough down there. I think I had a furlough from, uh, between, I'm trying to remember now, I did have a 14, 14 day furlough, I think, from Camp Gordon Johnson, I believe. So you did get home and see your, I your did folks? I did three times, yeah. And tell them about uh, your training and right. all of that? Yeah. In fact, we took the took the bus from uh, Camp Gordon Johnson. Somebody drove us over, over to Tallahassee, the capital. We took the Greyhound to the train to uh, up north to the train, and I got a, got a train home from I think it was Jacksonville, I believe. On my fill. The Silver Meteor or the Silver Streak. That train, that uh, that ghastly train that ran up the coast. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't remember now. 
but it was it wasn't too bad. The hard part of it was on the train. I had to sit in the arm of it, it was so crowded. I had to sit in the arm of the coach all the way to Boston. Yeah, yeah. The, the hard part of it. All the way to Boston. From there, uh, did you uh, after the, your furlough? I've got you in Florida, and now Kilmer in New Jersey. Was that your next stop? Yes, I believe it was. Yeah. Okay, what were you doing at Camp Kilmer? Well, just getting reissued equipment. I think they told us that at that time, I believe it was going to go overseas. Okay, uh, you're at Camp Kilmer, and uh, you you guys are getting ready to go over. Right. Yeah. Finally, after all this training and everything, can you give us uh, some kind of a date on this? Spring of '43, I, I think. Well, what happened there? Uh, in a bit, we were, we were supposed originally we were supposed to go to uh, North Africa with a motorized division. We were supposed to go to North Africa and take on Irwin Rommel and Desert Fox. We changed our plans and uh, said we're going to probably go to Europe on ATL. And uh, we were reissued all, all of our equipment there, the equipment we got was made to go. And, and this is, st the, you're still with the, uh, the uh, men that you had been trained with in Georgia. Yes. Right. You're part of a solid unit and you're in the right. fourth the same, division. We're the same unit. Okay. Yeah. All right. Tell us about, uh, did they put you on a ship somewhere? Yes, we left from Camp Kilmer to Pier 69. We had to board the ship. It was, a, it was an old English ship called HMS Franconia. Oh, really? It was on the on the evacuation of Dunkirk. It had it had plates in it, deck sh well, from shell plates in it, from D Dunkirk, and uh, it was a, a rickety old ship. That's an old Cunard liner. That's uh, yeah, was it, was it, it, yes. You you traveled pretty well. The hell the whole the whole regiment, whole Eighth Infantry went on that on uh, Franconia. And you sailed out of New York. On New York Pier 69, right? Yeah. Tell us about that. You're, I, I'm figuring, 22 years old now, and you're in the United States Army. You get on a ship, and you're sailing down New York Bay. Where, was it day or nighttime? I believe, I, I don't have to right look. I think it was during the, probably, probably early morning hours, probably. You were able to see the United States slipping away. Well, what, what happened? What happened there? We, uh, we came over the PA system there. We, we're going to have to detour south because there's a German sub pack coming down out the north. So we de detoured all the way down, you know, off the coast of Florida before we started north again. Because there's a German sub pack that was uh, sighted. So we had to uh, detour off the coast of Florida and start north again to try to get away. Well, we got away from them. That meant a couple of extra days on the ship for right. you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Was, how, what kind of a passage did you have over to Europe? Well, well that was down below the down below the water line. I was kind of nervous to come torpedoes, you know, and so I was very nervous down there. But uh, very creaky, but a creaky old ship. But it was the gunners there, all right. Was this your first sea voyage? Yes. Yeah. And were you allowed on deck all the time and oh, yes. look well, around? Exactly. Had to go on deck because a lot of the men were sick. I was sick. I was sick myself. Very, very sick all over. Were other ships with you, Ralph? Yes, there was a whole it was a big convoy, a tremendous convoy. We had battle wagons and destroyers up in the flanks, left and right flank. You see the smoke and destroyer that blow the water. You see the smoke, and there's Liberty ships. There were ships in front of us that were going like this, you know, had no keel. And they were very, they were quite buoyant, but they were no, they could tip right. I thought they were going to tip over. It was the way it was sort of left over from side to side. But it's, uh, 
we got there, we had a big convoy. I don't know how many ships, but a lot of destroyers and battleships. And on the, on the flank, you can see it on either side, port side and the starboard side. Uh, and about how many days did it take you to get over there? It took us just two weeks to go across. Two weeks. Across, yeah, yeah. And where did you land? We landed at, at uh, the back door of England, Liverpool, the back door of England. That was uh, went through the Irish Sea, and you can see Scotland on one side, and you can see Ireland on the, on, on the other side. Ireland was the nearest to us. I can see the cows grazing the green grass. And really? I can see them grazing in the White House then. But Scotland was way off, and you see the dark hills of Scotland way off to the left. And we got off to Liverpool, and uh, it was all, well, it was all cobblestones, wet cobblestones. And I think it was wee hours in the morning, I believe. It was dark. And we got off there, and uh, but it wasn't, wasn't too bad. I mean, the, the worst part of the whole trip was I, I was awake from being sick. <laughs> being, I, I was nauseous, a little bit nauseous. But, it could have been a lot worse than that. You were met at the dock by trucks and uh, buses or whatever? Yes, by trucks. By trucks and, and, and where did they take you? Two and a half ton trucks. The, the workhorse of the army. Uh, they were a great, great vehicle. They took us to, uh, let me see now. A camp in the, in the town of Hornison, right in the town of Honiton, H O N I T O N, I believe. That was. Would you, would you spell that again? Pardon? Spell that again, please. Honiton, H O N I T O N. Honiton. A little town in England that made lace. It was famous for the lace and L A C, you know, and uh, I can't think of the name of it. I have a name of the camp, but in some way I can't think of the name of the camp. Oh, well, that's okay, but you were. <laughs> You got your feet on the ground now yes, and you're right. in England right, yep. uh, with your whole bunch of guys that you've trained with. Um, right. Did you get more training where you were now or what did they do with you? Well, we, we uh, went through a lot of the routine to make sure we had it, get it down and uh, just, just re 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 repetition a lot of the most of the repetition. What we've done now, Cam Gordon and Fort Dix. But uh, it was very, it was a nice camp, nice little camp. But the whole regiment was there, the whole 8th Infantry was there. Nice, nice little camp. And uh, I'm trying to think now. They had what they call British NAFIs over there, Navy and Army and Air Force Institutes. And they, they had pastry and drinks for the fellows and the big corrugated door was down and when they come up all, all the giants rush in get, the, get, get, the, get a beer or get uh, <laughs> something to eat but they were the beer only was warm warm and no refrigeration oh, and yeah. it was warm <coughs> the pastries are very good though you know, the crumbs and fats and I was going to ask you if uh Mm -hmm. If they let you off the base, and, and obviously they did, uh, can you describe what you saw of wartime England? What did it look like? Had, were you in an area that had been bombed at all? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I saw Coventry that was heavily bombed. Was that before or after the big raid? That was after, I believe. After, yeah. yeah. So you saw the ruins of the cathedral? and. Uh, the rest of the town that got so, plastered. I saw, a lot, saw a lot of ruins there. Yeah. And out, we come to these long barrage balloons flying up there then at that time. For the incoming low flying aircraft. But the barrage balloons all 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 over. And uh, that was a nice little town. We didn't, wasn't too bad at all. But uh, then, then we, uh, I was trying to think now. That wasn't too far from Plymouth. 
I mean, Exeter and Plymouth. Exeter was the nearest town, and uh, that's where I experienced my first blackout, was in Exeter. I went from, went from Harlem uh, on the train to Exeter. It was all shades of train pulled down from, from lighting and all. Everything was a real blackout. So you, you, uh, you were obviously within the, the range of the German bombers? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever experience an air raid while you were there? I experienced a, a flying bomb explosion not too far away. Would you tell us about that? This is a V1 or V2 or a, a v buzz bomb. V1, a v1 buzz bomb. Yeah. It what happened. It uh, we were standing standing in line, the channel line. Uh, that was let me see what was that now? That was in line. I'm just trying to think where that was now. I think it was in Harlem, somewhere in Harlem, I believe. Uh, we're standing in Chow Line, and we all had a mess kit, kits ready to be served or, or the kitchen there. And all of a sudden, we, we heard the, we heard this, uh, like a motor boat overhead, as they sound like. And when the motor boat stopped, that's when you had to watch out. That one's coming down there. It was an awful, awful sound. You could see, you could see some of them. You could see them. The flame coming from the from the rear of the, the plane of the bomb, and the, when it comes down, it landed probably from here to the church over there, away from the congregation church, away from the about there. three hundred yards away. Then just just a, a little, nearer, nearer than that. Yeah, nearer than that. That's the crater, great big crater. And of course, when it, when it hit. The uh, well, excuse me. Before, before it hit, the fellow said, "I'm going to get down because the, the motor cut on. It's going to come in probably." So if we uh, it finally come in, and then everything went flying from the concussion. Kiss, mess kiss went flying, full light, every, every every which way, and. Uh, The great crater was tremendous. I can't were, were any Americans killed by this thing? No, fortunately at that time, there was nobody near enough to know. But it, it knocked us down. A lot of those guys knocked down. Nobody was really injured. The concussion was tremendous. I can't, I can't describe the concussion. It was terrible. A huge blast then, a huge crater. And great you guys, crater. You were lucky, weren't you? I'm very fortunate. Yeah. <laughs> very. What else? Um, what else can you tell us about wartime England? You described a blackout, uh, seeing a buzz bomb. Um, how about other people, other armies? Did you uh, meet anybody from the British armies, or were there any French or uh, people there getting ready for the invasion? Well, what happened <coughs> at the uh, at the NAFI, there, the English Navy and Army and Air Force Institute, we call them. I, I, I spoke about earlier. I, I did meet a couple of Tommies, two or three Tommies in the helmets on, full uniform. But actually, I never came in contact with any any army organized group, army. Yeah. Uh, just to talk briefly to those Tommies and so on. Let's talk about uh, your being part of the. I assume you took part in the. Invasion here. Yes. Uh, tell us about leading up to that. Were you all brought back to your base and told that uh, there's no more uh, liberties, no more going ashore? Tell us about being locked up prior to it. First of all, we had. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We were allowed to go on pass to London because of a bus bomb, bombings, and aircraft, and air bombings in London were, were terrible at the time. We weren't allowed to go on pass because we might get, we might get. So you were confined to the area of yes, the base? Yes, yeah. they didn't allow me to pass okay. at all. So uh, what happened, we were, from from there, from where well, we were at the camp in Harlem, we went to, uh, down to Plymouth, 
we uh, debunked, we got, didn't that, we, we, we marched to, we had to march from Arlington to Plymouth down to the, uh, to the, uh, down part down to the water. The ship was, the flagship there waiting for us. And we board the flagship there at the, at, at Plymouth, get on there. I think it was, yes, it was a whole regiment, I believe, you know, the whole 8th Infantry. And uh, we got on there, and then we went to the, we knew we were going, we knew that we were going to go across the channel. They uh, had told us before we were in pilot, I think pilot invasion. Des describe, Ralph, what was going on around you. I assume Plymouth Harbor was packed with ships. All kinds of boats. What, a, what about over your head? What kind of uh, activity? Planes going toward France? Or planes going back, come and go on, barrage balloons all over the, all over the area. The invasion yeah. was on the 6th. Um, when did you get into Plymouth? A uh, couple of days ahead? A few days ahead of the time, yeah. Uh, and did they immediately put you on a ship? Yes, they did. So you had to wait on board a ship rather than the... Right. Oh. It was a flying ship, I believe. Yeah. And the, the flying ship, on, the, on board the flying ship for, I think it must have been two or three days, I believe. Something. Then we uh, had, and we took, I, I don't know the details, it's been so long. Well, it, there was a, a big storm on the 5th, so you didn't right. go. That's exactly right. Uh, tell us about being on board that ship in Plymouth Harbor. You must have been surrounded by literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people. We were wondering what was going on. There were so yeah. many boats, so many ships there, the barrage balloons everywhere. And uh, so we, we boarded the ship there. The, uh, we were told that we were going to take part in the, in the, in, in, in the invasion after we've been there. Okay, and now there. now when you're on board the ship, uh, you knew you were going to the coast of France, but did they tell you where or what you were supposed to do when you got there? I am not, they told, told us something, but I can't remember just, just how, 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 how they stated it to us. We said we were going to take part. Did you listen carefully and pay attention? That's all we, and then we, we were, we were, we were give us orientation course, I believe, before the, before the landings. But uh, we're up in the, in the water, it's been two or three days ago, it's run away with, with the flotilla that was up there. There were battleships, all, all kinds of gunboats everywhere. Flat tops, everything. Really. The largest invasion in history of any, any land area. <coughs> so we, we run over there for a while, and, and we uh, kept moving around, and, I, and the photos were getting kind of restless. They were wondering, they were wondering why there was so much movement on, on our ship. They were, we were getting jogging for position, I suppose. Well. You were setting up, uh, or tell me, uh, why were you moving around so much? That, that, that we d didn't understand. We were trying to get, get in our own area to take part in the landing. And shifting around. Somebody there. had figured out where you should be in this huge parade of ships. And right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then you set sail. You're off. Can you tell us at all after this distance in time what your own personal feelings were? You're about to go into combat. I was scared. I was scared. Scared to death. I didn't know what was ahead of me. We were all praying on the boat, you know. Uh, we had, had a service on the boat before we got on the, on the barges. And, uh, I think I went to a service on, 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 the, on the board, and the chaplain prayed with us that everything would go well. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience. The boat was, the boat was very, the, the boat was, the flagship was very pleasant. I can't think of the name of the flagship now, but. It wasn't too bad at all. Combinations were pretty good. Yeah. What 
what is the first thing as it begins to get light and you finally see the coast of France? Uh, I'm just trying to recall. Difficult to recall the exact time. Of course, HR was 6.30 and uh, on June 6th, HR was 6.30. We, uh, we told us that there'd be some barges come along. The water was pretty rough. Like the ship was, like, like this, should be, this was, the swell was pretty, pretty bad. But uh, the uh, the barges finally came alongside, and we were told to go down the cargo nets. Be careful going down the cargo nets into the barges. LCBPs, landing craft personnel, barges, small barges. And uh, I forget how many were on the bar, each bar, I don't know now. But it must have been probably a couple of squads or something like that. I'm not sure. But uh, they, they were uh, a number of barges there, quite a few. I could see, uh, almost, almost as far as I could see, there were barges in the water. How, uh, were these self-propelled? Or were they towed, or what moved? No, they're self-propelled barges. Okay, okay, and you're standing on one of these things. I had, had to go board down the cargo net into all the barges. I could down on one of the barges because the, like this, the water, water come in the barge going down like that, up and down. And several of the foes, uh, they fell from the cargo net in, right in the barge. Fortunately, I <laughs> I don't know how you did it. I get down the barge, don't make problem at all. The full fuel equipment on the back and the steel helmets on. And the, and the, and the, the full fuel equipment with the ship like a horseshoe on our back. And the steel, full fuel equipment, everything. And the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> I'm trying to think now. Yeah, they were called LCD, as I said earlier. LCVP, landing craft vehicle personnel. Ralph, what did it sound like? What did you hear? Could you hear gunfire, bombs, I heard explosions, all. rifles? I heard everything. I heard machine gun fire, I heard rifle shots, I heard the bomb. I could see bombers going overhead. How and far out from the shore were you? I don't know exactly. I can't, I can't recall. I can't recall that. Pro pro must have been, I would say, probably uh, well, three or four hundred yards, probably. That close? And, uh, quite, quite close. It, it, that's my recollection, you know. But uh, I'm just trying to think now. I went, uh, B-17 is going overhead, and B-25, they're all heading in. That made us feel better when we saw those. It, that the uh, friendly planes up there. Specifically, where were you on the coast of France? Where did you go ashore? What beach? Utah Beach. You Utah were on Utah Beach. Beach. We, we went ashore on the, I was not in the first wave. I think it was the seventh wave, I believe, the same outfit. Because the, the fourth division was, was the only outfit that hit, hit, hit the Utah Beach. I'm sure you saw the only outfit, and they were they were uh, <coughs> first outfit in France that uh, came in contact with the Germans. Very first outfit, and uh, at Utah Beach. What time of day was it now? If you're in the well, seventh well, wave, HR was six thirty. The first wave at yeah, six thirty. That was my outfit, of course. But we were back just a little bit from that. I was told it was the seventh wave, and uh, but even, even then I could hear all, hear all kinds of bombing, I hear shell, shell, shell burst, machine gun fire, rifle shot, everything. Was it broad daylight now? It was just getting light. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Your barge is moving in. M going in. Yeah. Um, what's around you? What do you see? Barges on each side. 
And in front of you, what do you see? Well, just the same, same outfit, you know. Excuse me. And uh, we uh, <coughs> hit the, we landed at the beach. That bumped it. Hit the beach. And it must have been about three feet of water, I would say. The ramps went down. And we went off. And he go all sides and said, come on, move us. Go fast. So we went fast as we could. When I got off the water up to my waist, I had to hold my weapons over, over my head. And uh, then we hit the, the beach. And uh, they had, at that time, they had tapes on the beach. They had cleared the minefield so we could have a swath to go through. OK. Nobody has ever told us this before. Oh, that's so? Was the water cold? It was cold, yeah, English Channel. It, it was, was cold. cold. It was cold, yeah. And you're in three feet of water, so you got your waist, waist so, down, so you're soaked, and you're running across a beach. What do you see on this beach? Well, I, I, it was such a, such a fluid commotion there with all the men landing. You hear them yelling and screaming. You hear, I can see pillboxes, I can see general replacements, pillboxes, and I put a gun fire in land. But uh, actually, Utah Beach was not as bad as Omaha Beach. What were, you, what were you armed with as you're going ashore now? Well, I had, uh, at that time, I wasn't carrying it. I was carrying some am ammunition boxes at the time. For the 30 caliber? 30 caliber. And I had a, a car being slung over my shoulder, I believe, at that time. So are you following a guy carrying a gun? Yes, we all were. You're a part of a little we team deployed, here. All, we deployed the way. He spread out like that. Oh. So where he went, you had to go? That's right. So the old side would say, come on, keep moving, move, keep moving, moving. And so we kept moving. We were running as fast as we could. could. And we hit the sand all over our hands and legs and sand mixed in with the salt. Oh. Were there casualties where you were? Were uh, you running by not, not dead men, wounded men? I could see, uh, see a few on the beach, I guess. I don't know what outfit they were. I know what uh, was in my platoon, I don't believe. I was in weapons platoon. Uh, there weren't too many there. But as I get, as we get advanced inland, I could see more, more laying around. Tell us about the resistance in front of you. Were men firing at you, uh, infantrymen, or were you getting artillery fire, or what were you running through here? We were getting both. Some artillery fire. You hear the hit, you hit it go off, and the, then you hit the overhead or on the beach. You see the shell burst on the beach to either side of it. Fortunately, at that time, there was nothing in front of me. I was very fortunate that, that way. But I could see, uh, I could see German emplacements there on the toolbox, I could see. And uh, I'm trying to think now. But the, but the worst part for me was, was, was the sand and the salt. My, my, my fatigue was soaked. It was very uncomfortable. <laughs> but uh, it was, the output, the one ahead of us, I think it was. 12th Infantry, I, I was in the 8th. They must have had a little worse. We were, I think at the time we were in reserve at that time, I believe. And we didn't catch the, what the uh, advance unit caught. You ran across a beach, uh, then were you in dunes? And you know, like a, a typical beach, were, were there dunes, and then beyond that, were there buildings or anything? Or? There was, there was some, a few dunes. That you saw, you could see the grass, sea grass in the dunes. You could see, yeah. you could see that, and uh, there was nothing for quite a way. And there was a, it was a, uh, <coughs> a path, some kind of a path there, of grass uh, and soil that. Had, I don't know whether our men put it down, laid it down, or it was there before, I don't know. But we advanced, and as we further advanced, more vegetation we saw. 
you and I have both uh, seen all these old movies of Erwin Rommel right. setting up the Great Wall right. to, to keep you guys out. Uh, these the obstructions in the water, the mines, right. pillboxes that you've mentioned. Did you see any more of this, and how did you get through all of this? Well, what happened, the, the, the vast units, they had, they had these, uh, there were, excuse me, there were minefields there, and they had to pull the minefields, and they had, had to clear the minefields, what mines were in front of us. They put this white tape on each side for fire to go through, which we did do, we were fortunate that way. I think Robert and it might, might, have been, might have been two or three fellows who, who stepped in a mine that wasn't detected by the mine sweeper. <coughs> but it, uh, it wasn't too bad. On the beach, it wasn't too bad due to the, uh, the first unit that landed there. They, they cleared the minefield for us. How far did you run that day? Uh, Sure. How far did you get? I'm not sure. The first day, I'm not sure. But a little way in, we get to uh, the town. Uh, let me see now. I'm trying to think. We, we dug in outside of St. Mary Greece, I think, which may have been a mile or two off the beach. I'm not sure. Two mile, maybe two miles off the beach. Uh, I could see some buildings off the side, either side. And uh, St. Mary Gleese was the, the town. I had, had my first problem there. And St. Mary Gleese near Monteburg wasn't too far away. You so say you had your first problem there? Yeah. What was that? Well, I had a. I, I had a it was, it was dug in there, and the, the Jim and the 88s, the shelling of St. Jim and the 88s, the, Big, big rifle, it's all big rifle, and uh, I, uh, one hit the tree, tree burst over my head, caught me in my right arm here. Two frightened hit my right arm, and uh, my whole arm just went numb like that. I couldn't feel a thing. And then, uh, was this? Excuse me, but was this the very first day, or the afternoon, or the? I, not the sure. evening. I'm not sure. This is si it may, the sixth of June. It may have been. It may have been the second. I'm not positive on that. Maybe the seventh. It's yeah. My recollection. And you're hit. You're you're really hit. Right now, right? Yeah. And did you get uh, some kind of medical attention there? Well, they they uh, they, they evacuated. Wait a minute. It took me. I said I got it. It hit here. Some other guys were. We hit there at the same time. Three bursts, awful. There's just, there just there's a big 88 millimeter German. They're, they're big rifles they were. And uh, hit me on two more, one here, one's there. Uh, so they took me in on the jeep, the stretcher on the, on the jeep. I lead across the stretcher on top of the jeep, took me down the beach to to, to evacuate me. We took the other fellows, uh, GIs too. And uh, when I get down the beach, I there's some big LSTs there. The ramps are down, and they're waiting. And, uh, so they put me on, on an LST and, and sent me back to England. Moved back to England. So your total time ashore in France was uh, 24, 48 hours. Not very long. Hey, well, and then you got wounded, badly wounded, in your arm. Together well, with what I would think must have been a lot of other guys that day. Yes, there was several more from my help, two or three more, more from my help on the same LST with me. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know who they really were. I can't remember names. Did you know any of these men? Yes, I knew. I knew. Personally, you knew them? Yeah, oh yes. And yeah. they were also wounded? Yeah. But they weren't after some. And a couple of them probably were, were shell shot, that battle of fatigue. Where did they? Where did this uh, ship take you to? Took me back to uh, <coughs> England. Uh, I think I, I think it was, I think we got off of Southampton, I believe, from the LST. 
took me to an area hospital there in the, went to, which one was it now? One to England at first, first, and then well, we were only there a few hours. Then we sent them to a field hospital in Wales. In Wales. They took you all at Southampton, all the way up to Wales? To Wales, yeah. That's a long ride. That's pretty good ride, yes it is. Is that the nearest it, medical care? It was, sta it was a station hospital. And, uh, but the, the, uh, on board the LST, they were giving us some attention there. They, you know, my arm, of course, was black and blue, <laughs> one here, one there. And uh, I still have a fragment in my arm. And one of, I still have a fragment in my arm here, right down here. It, when you were um, taken from the beach, put on this ship, go back to England, were you able to, uh, s were you below decks or were you able to look around and see where you were? You were backing out through the greatest armada ever assembled That's right. That's right. at oh. the time. Did you, have an, did you have an opportunity to see any of this or were you pretty much concerned with your arm there? No, we, to my recollection, I did see quite a few, quite a few ships out there still, and of course, I could see barrage balloons everywhere. And uh, I think now, I, I saw I, I saw quite a bit going back. In fact, on that NLST with me, there were some German prisoners too. There were German prisoners going back. Really? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it at first. Were, were these men wounded as well? Yes, they were wounded, yeah. yeah. And they were all, in fact, in fact, I tried to speak to someone and I could, just couldn't understand me at all. That makes the war, I hate to use this expression, but it makes it very real, doesn't it? Suddenly sure, there's no, right. the men in gray. Almost personally, almost personally. Yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's not in distances anymore. That's right. This guy is uh, another human being across the exactly. ship from me. Yeah. Okay, they take you to Wales. Uh, where do you know where where you were in Wales? Town in Wales is called Abergavenny. A very nice little town. Wales is very much like England. Spick and span, not no papers. The sides road, nothing at all. Clean, very clean. Cobblestone streets. And uh, we, I was there. I, you know, I don't know how long I was there. I was at Army Hospital. Uh, I'm not sure how long I was there. But you got good care, I hope. And oh yes, I did. Yeah. How was it, were, was it a busy place? Were there a lot of wounded being taken yes, care of? Yes, of course you were there, right. I'm interested in how far removed this is from, say, Southampton or, or uh, even London. It's a long drive up to Wales. So they were putting men evidently in hospitals as far away as they could because they knew the closer ones would exactly. be filled up later. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and That's the best in the recollection. Yeah, yeah. well, it's a, it's a very <laughs> accurate one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, what did they do with you then after they patched you up? Well, I was there for a while. I don't, I don't know how long I was there. Quite a while. I was there quite a while, a matter of weeks. Uh, I, I was notified I was, I was to go back to my, I'm trying to get back to my outfit. And, and uh, so I, I did go back to my outfit. How did you feel about that? Um, would you rather, did you feel you'd done enough? Did you feel, hey, I hurt? Or did you really want to go back to the guys you had trained with? I wanted to go back with it. If I knew I was going back with it, then I wouldn't have to start a new one. I knew them, knew them there. When I get back, there were so many new replacements. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know a lot of them. But some of them I knew, a few that I still know. Is it true that one of the awful things that they could do to you is uh, put you into an outfit where you didn't know anybody and exactly. nobody knew you? Exactly. So the best thing in the world is to go back to your own That's outfit. Right. They try to do that as much as they could with all the 
Okay, so if, after you're fixed up a little bit, they sent you back. How did you find your outfit, and, and where was it? That way it was some thing. Uh, where were they? I was trying to think. I think it was the... Uh, Luxembourg. Uh, I think it was. Uh, they had moved that far since you left them. Yes, in quite a way. Then, in quite a way. Did you and sail back over across the channel? Yes, I had to go back. So the it's channel. deja vu all over again. Yeah, you're, yeah, to, you're going back to France again. I went back across the channel. It was, it was nothing there then. And all calm. And all you could see was all wrecks of uh, trucks and on the beach and old equipment on the beach there. And, and you, you caught up at Luxembourg, is that correct? And um, what did you do then with your outfit? You just started all over again as an infantry man? I started, started all over again, yeah. The same replacements there that I didn't know. Some of them were younger than I were, and they were quite... Uh, a lot of the new replacements didn't want to see the, the old fellows come back. They were resentful of the old fellows coming back. What, why would that be? Well, I suppose they wanted to, wanted you to know that they, they knew the story, the whole young fellow replacements. They knew what to do. But uh, they, were, they were green in a lot of them. I think I should ask, whatever happened to your machine gunner, you were supposed to stick with him, you had all his ammunition, and you disappear. Uh, you're wounded, you're, yeah. you go back. Was he there in the outfit when you came back to it? I'm just trying to, trying to recollect that. I think, I think he was there, I believe. In my it's been so long, I have, <laughs> I'm trying to recollect. I think he was there, but a couple of others were not, were not there. Where did you go from there, uh, Ralph? He went to, uh, I'm just trying to think. He went to, uh, yes, that, that, that was in Luxembourg, I believe. We uh, went too far from the Ardennes, the bulge. Quite pretty, quite quite a way in then, and uh, we were in reserve on a holding line. They sent us back to to where we were on a holding line from where I landed. We come back, come back a second time. That was supposed to be a rest area, but actually it was a holding line in reserve, holding line in reserve. And, and we were there for a while, and then that's when I, <coughs> excuse me, that's when I got, I got hit again there. Okay, let's, let's hold it a second here. Uh, it's very important to let's recall what time of the year this was. We're in late 44, or was it winter yet? Yes. Okay, and you're in the Ardennes, and we all know that uh, one of the greatest battles in Europe is about to hit you again. Uh, you're in the Battle of the Bulge, you're nearby. Um, tell us about where we, where you were. We and weren't, excuse me, we weren't near the, right at the Bulge. We were just a little way back from it, but not too far. I could hear, I could hear gunfire, I heard bombs and shells landing. And, uh, there were, there were, at that time, it was, we had a little bit of snow coming in, I think, and uh, not too much until we got a little further in there. But that's where I left the outfit there, near the, the Ardennes in Luxembourg, on a holding line, and that's where I left it. Cause I, caught, uh, I, got, I had a head injury there. Mortar shell come in. I hate to talk about this, but it's part of my story. Mortar shell come in, and the man with me in the foxhole was killed, right, right alongside me. 
I have, I have, I have head wounds. This is a mortar burst, and this is part of the Battle of the Ardennes. Well, see, yes, they were shelling there too. Okay, so you're in December of '44, and it's a terrible cold winter, and you're now you're wounded in the head again. This, this, this is the first time. Well, I meant you're wounded again. Yes, in again, the right. head. No, right. that's still not right. But, uh, I know what you're saying. And then that that sent me back. Uh, I, just, I didn't know what happened. I was told later that Buddy with me was killed. I didn't know what I was doing. I just ran off. He told, he told me to run, get out quick. So I just, just took off and I passed out somewhere. Somebody picked me up, I don't know who it was, and took me back to, to the beach. I mean, back to the uh, landing strip. And took me back, took me back, to, uh, took me back to Paris, France and at the 48th General Hospital in Paris, France. And uh, from, there I took a, from there I took a uh, C-54 transport plane back to the States. How did you get from the Ardennes to uh, France, to Paris? Were you flown in? Or I don't know how I got back to, from where I was hit to, to the airstrip. I don't know how I got back. So, so you, you, you were flown in? You, they took you to an airstrip, yeah, and, then, to, and then you flew to Paris. C forty seven probably took me to the okay to the uh, what and, was it? And, and that, it's that, that's one part of my experience I don't remember at all, Abby. Because I passed out, I was running, I just passed out. Somebody picked me up, took me some, I don't know where, but they got me back to the, the plane, and uh, I. Uh, Next thing I knew, I was in Paris, France, at the 48th General Hospital in Paris, France. And uh, I uh, had a problem. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move my arms or legs. So I had to, go to, had to go to therapy for quite a while. I couldn't speak. And my, my arm, my left arm was like this, no, no dead, no feeling at all. Left leg was. My left, my left side was paralyzed. My left arm, my left leg was completely paralyzed. I couldn't I didn't raise it like this, and I had to move my leg like I couldn't move it at all. I couldn't talk. I was very lucky, very fortunate. How long were you in Paris? Gosh, was, uh, for, for quite a while. I must have been a month anyway. I must have been. See, see these dates. These days or so are very hazy to me. I can't remember the. Well, I'm sure you were thoroughly medicated. I was, yeah. You know. And so I, I wanted to, I, so it was, I was up for being sent to home, back to the States. And. Uh, how, how'd you get there? Pardon? How did you get back to the States? On the, on the big, big ATC, Air Transport Command, the four, four motors. It was a prop, prop plane. And uh, I landed at Prescott Island, Maine. Prescott Island, Maine. In the this was in February. And it was cold, it was awfully cold. Snow on the ground. And uh, then I, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. They kept me there for a while at Prescott Island. And from Prescott Island, I, uh, I went to, uh, I got on a, ATC Transport Command flew me back, flew me back to the States. Atlanta first kind of lane. And uh, I didn't know uh, how long I'd be there. I was there for a while. And from there on, I went from first car, I went down. They flew me down to Helen General Health Hospital on Staten Island. I was there quite a while. I had a long period of, of rehabilitation. I'd be able to talk. I'd be gradually. I'd move my arm and leg after, after quite a while. So today I have trouble. I stand on it once in a while. I'm good my, I have a phaser, what they call a phaser. I couldn't speak. Were you uh, discharged from the service in 
in Staten Island, or yeah, uh, that was that was the end of yeah. your army yeah. career. Yeah. About when was that? Yeah, July third, nineteen forty-five. So you were in the hospital a long time. Quite a while. Yeah. July of forty-five. July third, nineteen forty-five. Yeah. Did you go home? Where did you go home to? I, uh, I went. I went home. My mother and my, my mother and my, and her sister met me at the, uh, you see, at the South Station. At the, oh, excuse me, uh, at the Penn Station, in New York. I took the train home from, to the South Station, and went back to back to Weston, where I lived at the time. You've had time then and now. Um, before you went into combat against the Germans, you had heard about them, read about them. Um, I wonder if your thoughts were different after the fact. All the things you heard about them beforehand, mm -hmm. after you had confronted this army, what was your thought about the Germans? We knew we knew ahead. Of, excuse me. We knew ahead of time a lot of the weapons were what they're capable of doing, and then uh, it's just about my expectations with the exception of a few of them were far greater than I thought they'd be. And the German 88 millimeter that was, that was a fantastic weapon. Just a boom like that. It's a, it's a big, it's a big rifle. So. I guess it's sometime or other been voted, oddly put, but the best weapon in the war. I would say on so. either side. That was incredible, and the tanks, the armor was very heavy. Those Tiger tanks and the Panther tanks, armor was like this. Our tanks were no match for theirs at all, as far as the armor. Did you feel that you were properly equipped for what the United States Army asked you yes, to do? Yes, positively. We were, we in were uniforms, equipped. weapons. Right. right. What about standing around in the cold in that December of uh, '44? Were you properly equipped? I we had a heavy OD coat on, overcoat. I, I had my I had my leggings on. I believe I had my heavy GI shoes on at the time. I think we were properly equipped, I would say. I, I mean, I got gloves too, so I was cold. Yeah, it was a, it was a bad winter. Ralph, you've told us quite a bit about your, what you did. Is there um, one memorable experience that stands out in your mind that you'd like to tell us about? And there was no, there was no, uh, as far as experience, there was no humorous experiences over there. There were in the States, but not over, over there. I'm just, I'm just trying to recollect something now. There were two or three horrible ones, right? I don't know what I mentioned. But this also, this uh, is the time to talk about uh, what happened to you. The Germans had a, a uh, more was called a screaming Mimi, and that, that was that, that was something terrible. You, you hear it wind up, hear it wind up, go, uh, wind up, and then you couldn't hear a thing. Everybody said, "Well, get down, so we'll get down." So we did. And one time I saw must have been a platoon of men. After after hit, they were just mangled, nothing to it at all. I have no good experiences I recollect as far as uh, humorous uh, otherwise. No, I, I, it's on my list, but I won't ask you if the, <laughs> there was a humor experience. What about a, a memorable character? You met a lot of people, served literally in foxholes, walking. Uh, one guy stands out or one person? Back in the States, in basic training, one stands out. <laughs> the uh, one man he couldn't he could, couldn't uh, couldn't keep in step couldn't do the facing well going the wrong wrong way 
and we had an old buck sergeant, he was an old training sergeant at Camp Crofts, and uh, he would uh, he would, he would come out and the close order drill would be up drilling in the drill ground, in the playground. And he'd say, uh, this simple man with the other step, of course, and he'd say, now you, Robert, you get this step, not for my sake, but for Christ's sake. Okay. It was the funniest thing. I don't like to use the words name of name, I don't know. But uh, I'm sure that got his attention. Forgive me for saying that. And then another, another time, too, where it was a man, uh, one man was afraid to take a shower with, with the rest of the men. He didn't want to take a shower with the rest of the, his outfit. That made his career very difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True, yeah. And you see, I think that something else, there was one other one I had written down somewhere. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, down south at Camp Crofts, when the, uh, the old sergeant came in and met the barracks, put the light on, he'd say, Okay, men, up and down. Okay, men, up and down. You too, Ralph. <laughs> That must have made you feel very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was uh, he was from Boston too. He was in Boston. That's uh, a New England sense of humor, I guess. It sure is. When you were discharged, uh, with what rank? What was your rank at that? Private first class. PFC. PFC, and, right? And uh, with what decorations did you have? Well, I had I had, I had the purple hat with the oak leaf cluster. I have the bronze medal. Bronze star. Well, bronze star, I mean, yeah. And I had the, that came along with the, with the combat infantryman's badge. I had the uh, victory medal. I had the uh, uh, ETO medal with a uh, ribbon with three stars on it. And I had the uh, good conduct ribbon. Each ribbon that you get in the service looks like a medal. Well, the trophy medal I didn't get. I, didn't, I don't know why. I didn't bother get them. But and then the, I, had a, oh, I had a little medal the marksman for, for the M1 and the Brownie automatic rifle. You fired BARs? That's uh, that's a tough cookie. You oh, you should get a medal for that. That's a good one. Did you join any reserve unit when you came home? No, I didn't. I went. My father bought an American Legion over Western. So he said, he said, Ralph, I will come into the into the uh, Legion with me. I said, Sure, I'm glad to. So I, I joined the American Legion post. Okay. In Western. And uh, then I I moved to Natick. I, I, I blown the DAV here in Natick also, Natick chapter. But no reserves, no reserves. How important to you, Ralph, was serving in the military? Well, it was very important, I believe. It helped me out a lot. A way that I couldn't, wouldn't have anticipated if I, if I hadn't gone. Men, as, associated with men, people that I took liking to, a lot of them, and uh, taught me to take, you know, take care of myself, you know, self-reliance, and you know, things I wouldn't have done normally if I hadn't gone. What did you think then about the war that you volunteered to get into? And looking back at it now from a distance of more than, oh, half a century, what do you think about it now? I think it was a godsend. It had it was a tremendous adventure. If we hadn't, if we hadn't, uh, if we hadn't gone when we did go, and uh, gone to work in all the defense plants to all the materials to use for the war. He would have been over here. I think. I think. 
Germany would have come, would have uh, tried to uh, expand from they did. Not only Europe, but probably part of Asia. Of course, Japan collapsed, Italy collapsed. But uh, I think they would have, uh, would have tried to uh, extend his sphere of dominance, even the United States. But they had uh, that the German science was, you couldn't be incredible at that time. They, they were working on jets then, in World War II, the Germans were. The science was unbelievable. Even the weapons were, the rifles were all right, but the, the machine guns and the, and the burp guns, they call them, and the uh, machine pistols, incredible weapons, just incredible. They were ahead of us weapons, they were ahead of us mm -hmm. overall, you know. Do you think there's a, a difference in public opinion regarding veterans who served in uh, your war, uh, war um, and those who were in Korea or Vietnam? There was opinion. Uh, well, I think, I think all, all of them, myself, all of those wars were the full-fledged wars. They, they were not a, not a president's war, a president's war. They were full-fledged con uh, uh, conflict wars, as far as I'm concerned. And, and I think that they, I respect them all, every, every one of them. In fact, today I would help any man, any person, anywhere that I could. If we got, if we got a, 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 a war he participated in. Vietnam was very important, I thought, even though it didn't. And the great deal show for it. Uh, Korea, that was that was a full-fledged war, believe me. They all were full-fledged wars. My outfit, the 4th Infantry Division, served in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Army occupation, just about every phase of, of the uh, war and after, aftermath of each war. Have you uh, yourself um, received any or taken any benefits uh, from the Veterans Administration? You uh, certainly had a great deal of hospitalization and medical care. How about uh, GI Bill, mortgages, anything like that? After the war, I, my father worked, worked in Boston. He was, uh, he was in the church, he was a church organ builder, and he had the uh, he was a real voice of voice of pipes in the organ. He wanted me to come in to work with him, so I went to work with him for a while. And uh, they gave me some, some tools in, in GI uh, on the job training. I, I, I was entitled a few tools which I, which I got. Hammers, saws, and drills, things like that. I worked with him in the shop for, for about four years. And I, after that, I, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't take. I loved music, but he was uh, he was a very talented man. I, I loved music myself. Like I couldn't take the squealing of the pipes. It just drew the problem I had because my ears, to this day, my ears are ringing, still ringing. <laughs> Some day, the worst numbers. So I take I take med 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 a lot of medication. So that that was really not the <laughs> job for you. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Ralph, we've been talking here for almost ninety minutes. Oh. I guess is there one thought or one incident that um, you'd like to tell us about that's not on the tape yet? Uh, that somebody a long time from now looking at this tape would uh, would add to the history of your career in the armed forces. Mm, that's a challenge girl like that. Well, well, I, well, I was, I, I cried. I saw the men. It went down all around me. The man in the, in the foxhole with me was killed outright. I didn't know about that. 
to several years later, didn't really bother. Uh, the thing that was, I, I felt the worst for that a lot of my bodies went down. I actually cried. Number of times I cried. And uh, that probably, and of course, a lot of the other. I, well, I lost two or three buddies. I lost one in the 8th Air Force, he went down in England. I lost one in the 3rd, I was in the 4th Battalion, one other body in the 3rd Battalion, he was a rifleman. And he and I were very close, he went down. And the, the man with me in the whole, I, I, I was really very friendly with him. We lost him. Those are the ones that went down, they were killed. That, that leaves a lasting impression that I'll never, I'll never get over. Frank, thank you for coming in today. We very much appreciate your oh, being with thank us. Thank you for your time, man, to take a little sound. I hope it was satisfactory.